Hello everyone, come in, welcome to this exciting Freedom Across the Globe showcase. Thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah, we're really excited to hear um, loads of young people's voices from across the world today. Um, just as people are coming in, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping. So along the bottom, um, you should be able to see some AI generated captions. If you don't see that, then you can hover over the bottom of your screen um, and there should be a, a button for live transcript. Um, and if you find them annoying, you can just turn them off and all of the poems will be subtitled anyway. So you don't need the closed captions on for that. Um, yeah, my name is Helen Bower and I'm so happy to be here. Um, I run the, young, the Poetry Society's Young Poets Network in the UK. Um, and if you don't know us, the Poetry Society is the UK's biggest poetry organization. We were founded in 1909. Um, and working with young people and schools is one of the biggest things that we do, um, as well as Young Poets Network. We also run the Foil Young Poets of the Year Award, which is the biggest poetry competition in the world for 11 to 17 year olds. Um, and it's currently open for entries until the 31st of July. Um, and we're co-running this event with Urban Word NYC, really excitingly. Um, and Kamia Davis is here to tell you a little bit about them. Hello everyone, wherever you are in your respective time zones. My name is Dr. Camille Davis and I'm here with Urban Word. I'll tell you a little bit about our program and specifically the young people we have with us today. So Urban Word elevates youth voice and leaders at the intersection of literary arts and civic engagement. We focus on the transformative power of the written and the spoken word. We provide young people places to share their creative voices. And often our students that we work with are marginalized and we give them tools and training and platforms to rewrite their narratives and to shape their lives, to own their agency and direct it at future communities to make change. So we are so excited to be here. We're so excited to collaborate with the Poetry Society of the UK. And today we'll be featuring a few of our poets from the National Youth Poet Laureate Network. It's a network of over 60 programs across the United States. I'm the national director of that program. And Urban Word created and founded the National Youth Poet Laureate Program, really to elevate youth voice and to give young people civic platforms to share their ideas. And today we have with us our fifth National Youth Poet Laureate of the United States, who was just announced this past week. And we also have our Northeastern Regional Finalists who will be sharing poetry today, as well as our Ann Arbor Youth Poet Laureate, who will be one of the co-hosts today. So if you would love to find out more about our programming, we're taking our Youth Poet Laureate program internationally, and you can go to urbanwordnyc.org to learn more and to sign up for workshops that are offered online and just get engaged in what we're doing eventually across the world. So we're so excited to be here in this international space. And I like to pass it over to our youth hosts. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, thank you to Urban Word for hosting this, Helen and Fee for being here and having us be a part of this experience. To start us off, we have a live performance from Serena Yang, a poet and writer who serves as the 2021 NYC Youth Poet Laureate and the Northeastern Regional Finalist for the 2021st National Youth Poet Laureate title. Born in Singapore and raised in Queens, she is a first generation Chinese American immigrant and her work reflects her myriad identities and moves towards our collective liberation. A former Resist, Recycle, Regenerate fellow with a WOW project, 2019 Youth Poet Ambassador at Urban Word NYC and member of the Beyond Acceptance Research Collective, BARC. She also performed at the 2021st NYC COVID Memorials Ceremony alongside the New York City Mayor and the NY Philharmonic. Give it up for Serena Yang. Thank you for blessing us. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm going to be reading a few poems. Um, I'll start with a poem that I have not read aloud before, but this is after Franny Choi's poem, Glossary of Terms, if you know how that poem goes. Um, this is Whale Song, meaning survival contingent on song. Upon learning of the whale song, 
Humans hung up their harpoons. Bloodless monster become gentle giant. Moby Dick become Moby Dick. Meaning, whales sing for no reason at all. See also, haunts and hauntings, heart sounds and other autopsies. The sounds our bodies make when we're asleep, the secrets we tell for no one to hear. Antonym, the loneliest animal in the world is the 52 Hertz whale. The loneliest animal in the world is the scientist who waits all year for whaling season only to hear a song. Antonym, the tongue, the hollow mouth. Origin, the loneliest animal in the world sings only when you're listening. Survival contingent on them knowing we exist. Dreams of being, a full sentence. That was Whale Song. I highly recommend you check out Franny Choi's poem, um, Glossary of Terms. If you have this book, it's the first poem in here. And yeah, that was written after that poem. Um, the next poem I'll share is a longer one. It's called Folktale. It's hard for me to trace my, where I'm from to a single location or place or border bound political state um, somewhere in this world. And my poetry is also similarly not bound by that. So this poem is called Folktale. Folktale, noun, a story circulated among a people by word of mouth sometimes passed down from parents to their children, often considered to be false or based in superstition. In every version of this story, my people have a poor memory. Correction, my people trade memories like tongues, worthless until cut out, better the tongue than the teeth or the throat or our stomachs. I have never seen my grandmother's tongue, but every night her teeth float in a little cup on the sink, pretending to be bone. Before 1899, millions of oracle bones were ground into dust and swallowed as medicine. Then we learned of how they once told the future, and so we stopped eating our ghosts. Modern day retelling. My Chinese teacher keeps asking me if I remember, if I remember this word, that means history or poem, the hour or a room, careful how you hold your tongue or time collapses into just the space between four walls or you hear a poem once and it becomes your ancestor. The moral of this story is my grandmother's teeth will survive her, but tongues are less bloodless. Example, a white man with a PhD in Asian studies keeps asking me where I'm from so he can tell me the name of every Chinese city he's ever been to. These men always have perfect memories. And so he says, once I spent three weeks in Shanghai, twice I spent two days in Wuhan. I bet I've been to more Chinese cities than you have, girl with a Chinese name, a Chinese face. But these are not the only things I've inherited from my people. My people have a poor memory. My dad, who likes to start all his stories with I remember, who never knew how to remember without lying. His favorite story is the one where he meets my mother for the first time, in Wuhan when they were five, in Shanghai, Beijing, Wuhan again, but this time they were seven and it was still summer. The truth is Changjiang meets the Eastern Sea just outside my mother's childhood home in Shanghai. And in the west, it floods Sishui every summer, the dirt floor of Yeye's old house growing damp beneath my dad's feet, the ground soft enough to hold the memory of his body for just a minute. The truth is my dad learned to swim by not drowning, and this is how he really met my mother, and what is memory but a second chance. Some branches of my family tree end in nothing. And you may have a perfect memory, but Changjiang means long river, and water never forgets anything it touches. In one version of this story, I am born without a tongue. In another, my mother gives it away for a pound of white rice and a green card. In another, you bleach my tongue, then ask me to make your language beautiful, and so I cut it out myself. Ask me again where I'm from. I'll tell you I'm a shapeshifter, poet liar, truth teller, storyteller, myth weaving, legend breathing, living folktale. And what is a folktale but an oracle bone that survived fire by splitting itself in the shape of the future? And what is a poet but the last witness 
to the fire. Thank you, thank you. Wow, that was, honestly, I love being in such creative spaces. It's, it's. I think it's a bit, um, it's gonna, I think we've got a lot of poems today and that was a way to start it off. So I'm really grateful to hear that. Thank you very much. It thank was amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, and be sure to check the, the comments support. because everyone's really, <laughs> everyone loves it so much. Okay, and to segue onto the Freedom Across the Globe project, last week, Freedom Across the Globe ran two international workshops in two different time zones with Yomi Shode and Gabriel Ramirez. Poets aged 14 to 25 were asked to write new work on the vital free theme of freedom, and then in the space of a couple hours to work with other poets across borders and create collaborative poems. They created some amazing work in just 120 minutes, and we're going to be premiering those poems as part of today's showcase. At the same time, Freedom Across the Globe was open for 14 to 25 year old poets to submit their own individual poems on the theme of freedom. And today, we're so excited to share 10 of those. We're going to hear young poets in the UK, Ireland, the USA and India. And we're going to start with Isha Jane. Isha Jane is 15 years old and lives in India. She's been writing poetry since she was six years old, but this is one of the first times she's showcasing it to other people and the world. So be sure to show your support. She has lived in six different countries and is, in, and is interested in theatre and piano. In her poem, Isha explores how many people across the world don't have a voice and the frustration of many young people who don't know how to help. Give it up for Isha Jane. Perhaps. I sent a piece of my voice by express post yesterday. I think I found it under my bed or peeking out of a desk drawer, a sliver of voice, sustained by this privilege I possess. Because perhaps someone else in this world may need it a little more than me. Wow, what an incredible performance. And to be able to translate such cadence and grit and stunning imagery through recording, that takes a lot of skill. Thank you so much, Isha. And next we have Ira, who is a student and artist pursuing her PhD in English in Mississippi in the United States. It's her first year in a new country away from home and she's been writing because there's nothing else to do. One of the amazing things about today is how fresh the work is. Many of the poems respond to events that are still unfolding as we speak. Ira's poem, How Many More Deep Breaths, is one of two poems that we'll hear today that respond to the escalating conflict between Israel and Philistine. Her poem also responds to the pandemic and how border controls can restrict freedom. And we can't wait for you to hear it. Thank you so much for blessing us, Ira. We can't wait to hear you. As the bombs rain down on Gaza, I remember Rafif Ziada's poetry. I try not to think about the resonance between Sheikh Jarrah and Baramula. Try not to think about army boots stomping on land they claim to protect, maintain peace with their guns turned towards civilians. And what of August 5th? What of the 21 days with no contact, no phone lines? Will that happen with Palestine or will we be witness? I don't know which is worse. To shut the world off? To hide state-sponsored murder than call each killing an encounter or to have the gall to broadcast your crime and call it progress. And what now do I do with March 2020? How convenient that the virus came, how easy then to claim protests are the pandemic, lay waste to the streets with your guns and your gas and your cannons and your khaki and your lati and your guns and your gas and your cannons and your khaki and your jati. The bruises on our backs may be gone, but we remember who you chose to protect and who you left dead in the gutters of the streets they grew up in. And now in America, where I study language, my visa does not allow me protest. How ironic that words on paper are deployed to keep us from speaking. I must somehow write an assignment about rhetoric. Back home, they breathe corpse dust through their masks. I sit in my balcony across the world and watch the sky split into one side lit up and the other dark. We only see what we are allowed to see, so we must learn to listen. 
a lightning bolt blinds me, but I pretend it is a portal to Delhi. The central vista keeps shifting. Eight workers to a tent. There is no room for the dying. There is no room for the dead. Delhi. My heart aches. We will not forget these times. Years from now when they ask us, your death is in our bloodstream. We will not forgive these crimes. Wow, I think people just need to take a moment to just really understand and really internalise that poem. It's so relevant, especially with what's going on at the moment. And I just really appreciate that poem for sort of bringing together the pandemic along with the, the current unrest ongoing. And it's it's such a, a wonderful poem and it's really poignantly written. And um, yeah, and just to go on to the next poet, um, just to, yeah, I guess to sort of move on to the next poet, it's a bit of a weird one. Madeline Herr is currently a junior at high school in California, and serves as a student trustee for the Jefferson Union High School District. She began writing poetry in middle school, inspired by her grandmother, a Korean poet. She was the first youth poet laureate of Daly City, California in San Mateo County, where she has spoken at events such as the San Mateo County Youth Commission's NORCAL Youth Empowerment Conference. Madeline's poem, Skin Care Routine for Street Walking, this is an everyday, everyday skincare routine to interrogate the way women are treated. Get excited for Madeline Her. Skincare routine for street walking. When I could barely touch the ground from deli stools, my screen flooded with DIYs for homemade face masks of honey and sweets, avocados and cream, lemon and tart. I dotted acne cream on my face until I painted a galaxy, peaked facial soap on my cheeks, molded bouquets like face paint. When I could barely cross the street on my own, I entered a war without barricades. When side mirrors show two shadows, I think about Bugs Bunny, try to make my skin look older and hope that they'll believe it. Maybe I can grow spines like roaches, but not an inch of my skin can be seen. I think about possums, to lay on gum-tattered curbs and wait for the hawk to leave, roly-polies to cup heavy breaths, cradle betraying limbs and armor. When tinted shields show stretching grins, I think about alleyway acupuncture. Prick my spine with leaves to bend at pests in hopes they'll pass over me. Blow dry my limbs till they crack cause you wouldn't want to follow a desert road. I don't wash my face till I get back so I can step off my tightrope and mom can try to wipe away too many whistles, clicks and calls that stain my eyes like freckles. I cover every inch of long sleeves with sticky peels, unscented, so I can tear it off at home. And I coat myself in eye shades so they won't see where they can find me again. Cause I'd rather scream for a second than let hungry eyes they left on me singe me, but I'd much rather not do either. And perhaps if I do this twice, maybe thrice, I'd have stripped myself so red I will never have to do it again. I drench my lips in war paint and eyes and charcoal to remove impurities, give me strength to run, remind me we're just two people, but it's two people every day. Remove my thoughts to jump sidewalks with racehorse stamina till it's finally safe to stop for the day. Though I'd much rather walk with my eyes closed and let my heart beat slowly. I streak my face with a moisturizing third grade spelling bee so I can memorize another license plate that left an empty seat for me. When his echoing calls never lets me sleep, I scrub myself with guitar strings until I'm down to the bone. So maybe I can play myself stammering lullabies to draw unbearable sounds of replaying scenes over and over and over again, to rip off burning prints of his hand on my thigh. I'm still trying to regrow like geckos. Skincare routine for street walking. For the man on the walk, face at the window, shadow on my route, hand on the bus, Camera on the train, eyes at the store, whistles at the curb. No, not for them. For us, the ones who suffocate in this armor we are forced to shrink beneath. To the jog to the store, trip to the car, flight from school, walk to the garbage bins in front of our door. I will not stand for you to string my body and drool and grab and play and film and stare and whistle and call and follow like rabid dogs anymore. Wow, incredible. I love, love, love that imagery, the use of creatures and animals to bring life to these different experiences. Thank you so much, Madeline. Next up, we have Sinead O'Reilly. Uh, they are a twice commended foil young poet and was selected last year as a part of Edna O'Brien's Young Writers Bursary. She loves cats and coffee. 
and is passionate about social justice, Sinead's poem, Dreams, looks hopefully to the future. So please welcome to the virtual stage, Sinead O'Reilly. Thank you. This is my poem, Dreams. Swinging on my best friend's swing set, my eight-year-old heart, a throbbing echo let loose in the world. I told her I'd save all the monkeys in Burma. My dreams are turning records, solid, built with mechanics, an abstract hope stirs from them. I dream of college, of finding myself in Dublin streets, late night walks. I want to find my soulmate at the back of an indie bookstore or bump into them drinking coffee. I think of all the people I still have to meet. I want to find stories, someone with which to be vulnerable. I want the world to heal, to unlock a democracy where stories are currency, fears in an open palm. I want to trust, to feel, to hold the world in my lungs until I might burst with what it is to be human. That was such a beautiful poem. It was so, so beautiful. Um, I really enjoyed it. Wow, that was, that was great. Um, next, we're going to go on to the group poems, and we're going to premiere the first two group poems from last week's Freedom Across the Globe workshop with Yomi Shode, hosted by the Poetry Society. In this first poem, the poets had to capture moments where they felt the most free. This first group poem features Cecil Preet Kaur, Annalisa Moa, Alex Chand, Olive Franklin, and Giant Kashyap, who cleverly tied together their carefree writing through repeating lines. Please get excited for Group A. I felt most liberated when I was singing on the top of my voice while cycling in the middle of the night. I liked it then, I liked it there. I felt like I was a bird for just one day. My mother keeps saying freedom is my name spelled backwards and I believe her. My mother keeps saying freedom is my name spelt backwards and I believe her. For I felt feet glide through laminated flooring like I was its polish. Cleaning steps although already rehearsed and I climbed through the music like it was the soundtrack to my life. Feeling eyes staring at me yet feeling like I was displayed to an audience of one no longer bound by restrictions in limbs or room coordinates, rather coordinating each beat to these feet, each break to these gates that my arms carried and each vibration felt right through to these fingertips. If this is what adrenaline feels like, then give me another shot of it. If this is what adrenaline feels like, then give me another shot of it. Wind turns at the haunt of chewed gum and dust rises into the lip of the storm. You'll find a history unspooling in this space between the tunnels and the fields and tumbleweed thistles. It's not written down. Listen, swoon to the music hitching its horse on the western wind. Discern the voices. Know the voices have been kept quiet as mythmakers rev their engines on the avenue above. Quiet as mythmakers rev their engines down the avenues above the airport, on the plain, trees outside soft as algae, and I am on my own, I am out of the water, my book, my passport, my undrunk coffee in the box at the airport, security, the bottom of my shoes heavy with radiation, and everything is green, somewhere my mother in a box below, and I know we will be safe all in our separate airspace. The map ruined with trees. The map ruined by trees in the midst of a night, in the idea of a secret train ride home, the thought of having hit that kid on the head, all that blood. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So many of those starting lines really stood out to me. My mother says, my name is Freedom Backwards, as well as Voices Are the Myth Makers. So, so beautiful. Thank you, guys. And next up, we have Group Poem B. Um, the next group were tasked with writing what they wanted to say to specific people, dead or alive. If they could sit down and talk to anyone, who would it be and what would they say? Introducing Berani Suresh, Miriam Cooley, Megan O'Neill, Libby Russell, and Noah Jacob. 
Thank you guys so much. We can't wait to hear you. Michelle Obama, I want to say to you as a girl who sat chest deep in the Mahabali River, staring quite daringly into the lens, silk splattered and nostrils flared, that had I heard you then, I would have stood up because we do not need to be chest deep or staring. We can stand up butt naked and glaring equals in rights to breathe and to live in the developing world as developing humans, human and loving and living. Florence Nightingale, I want to say to you, thank you for being an inspiration because to me, that's what you are. You battled daily with chronic illness yet still managed to change the world. Why does her illness matter, one may ask? It doesn't change the facts. But you make me believe an impact can be made by an invisibly disabled teenage girl. Brian, I want to say to you that you were heard by many people. You changed so many lives, you still do. Give people the chance to be free on stage. Give them the mic so we can all talk and be heard. You inspire, so keep talking and talking and talking. Give people the freedom to be themselves. Remind them that they are human. Come and join us, don't mind the noise. You say that everyone was welcome to write whatever, perform whatever, and we do. Bessie Harding, I want to tell you, you are not the first or last faceless woman on my research board. You and all the others line up like a march to protest your own forgottenness. Jesse, tell me where you're buried. I want to bring you flowers. I want to say I'm sorry that no one figured it out. No one cared about poor popular women, factory working women with fatherless babies and unmarked graves. From my parents, I have no idea what I should say to you. I don't know you really. I wonder how much you look like me. Two faces I've never seen. Come back. If only to tell me who I am, what you fought for, before you were a chain of ghosts. When I talk about it, people put a centrist. There are two sides to a genocide. I've seen both of them. Come back, if only to show me where you were cut away. I want to tell you my name. I want to hear yours. I think I was on mute for a bit. Got it now. Um, what I was just saying is that it was such a way to close the poem. I think all these poems, or all, well, this one poem, of different stanzas, stanzas, they sort of, I guess, pay their own special tribute to these individuals. And it's wonderful that I guess a lot of people may know Florence Nightingale. I haven't heard of Jesse Harding. And um, it's definitely someone I'm going to do some research upon right now. So um, thank you, Group B, for such brilliant stuff. We're going to hear a few more amazing individual poems now. Next up, we have Maddie Crease, who is a poet living in Southeast England. She writes mainly on the themes of mental health, as well as equality and diversity works from her lived experience. She has been published widely, has been a part of Apples and Snakes Writing Room, featured on local radio and commissioned by Beat Freaks, to name a few. Maddie's poem, Light, powerfully explores freedom from cycles of addiction. She writes, I can't be ashamed for you, and we can't wait for you to see this proud performance. Let's give us hope for Maddie Chris. Flash to the lights of Christmas Eve, the flash of lights in teary eyes less dull now. Years of admit, discharge, repeat, admit, discharge, repeat, admit, discharge, repeat, admit in the depths of crisis. Discharge upon plea after plea, no goodbyes, just rush out the door without looking back. Repeat. This time feels different, but so did the last, so are the lights. Just the flash from plastic trees on psych wards. Nah. Three and a half years on. It's late spring and no backward steps have come or gone or come or gone or come or gone or come or gone in the sun. On my shoulders is not traced to rationed and caged gardens. 
Tip your head to the sky, girl. Smile, girl. Take it in. Take in that light and all it brings, this sunshine sings. Girl turned scared, turned woman standing strong. Shadow cast back to a past of troubled days and nights crying. Tired of living, pushed to dying, but no more. I can't spend another day chasing a forbidden intrusion. So I'll stand up to this shadow. Square up and detach my feet from the ground. Sit, split for a moment from the past stretch to the sky and rejoice. Hospitals equate to the dingiest of secrets, closets of a skeletal girl and shrieking her mouths or panic alarms. I can't be ashamed for you. All this does is drag back to the past, look away from the sun and check your eyes back to my Christmas lights. Admit. Discharge, repeat, admit, discharge, repeat, admit, discharge, repeat, admit, discharge, set free. No more hospital. No more shame. And I am not going away. I'm, oh, I feel so many things. All of them are like just from the sweetest, warmest parts of my soul. What an incredible storyteller to take us on that journey. Thank you so, so much for sharing that. And our next poet is Kayla Morgan, who is a poet from New York City. She has been recognized by the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. She's a 2021 Ned Vecini Writing Finalist, finalist for the 2021 NYC Youth Poetry Slam, and was a winner of the Civil Rights Community Center poem from SPLC and Kwame Alexander. She was an opening speaker at a Cicely Tyson and Whoopi Goldberg event, and her work has been featured at NY1 News NPR and the Girls Right Now Anthology. Her poem, My Mother's Allegiance, explores the opposite of freedom, how even when a throat can bleed with eternal loyalty, its voice is too often shut down. Welcome to the stage, Kayla Morgan. My mother had recited the pledge, so her throat bled of eternal loyalty, hands on hearts devoted to the land of liberty. Ancestral faith and future days binded to her words, presented Uncle Sam with a salute. Bittersweet tears for salvation, the hollering of her heartbeats, and longing for a sanctuary had already settled in her eyes like a refugee camp. She bleached the potwa off her tongue, intertwined English with survival, threw her curry chicken and oxtail on a funeral pyre, the burning smell of the decaying food stifling her lineage. So pressed the kinky coals out of her Africana strands. She lost her roots, earned a savor of privilege. Echoes of, I surrender, ascending from her Jamaican wounds on one's hand. Prayers, knee on brown, head down bent to the red stripes on the other. My mother couldn't hear the barking. Barbaric, uncivilized savage, spewing like saliva, emerging from Uncle Sam's peace treaty. Her frantic footsteps fleeing to the white stars were too thundering. Wow, that was beautiful and powerful. I always love a poem that just shows so much emotion and so much. I just, I love when poets use their hands to express how they feel, and I definitely felt that in my core. That was wonderful. Amy Wollstoneholm is a scientist by day and a poet by night. I can relate to that. Originally from the beautiful Jurassic Coast. Whether slicing up a genome or carving out a stanza, her work comes from a place of awe and love for the natural world. Her recent works can be found in Visual Verse, Crow and Cross Keys, Magma, and in several places on the Young Poets Network. Amy's poem, 
freedom is a golden shovel, which means that the first word of each line in her poem can be put together to make a phrase by another writer. Normally, it's hard to tell when a poem is a golden shovel without reading the poem, but Amy has come up with a clever way of signaling the borrowed words. Put your hands together for Amy Walsenham. Freedom. When I walk home alone, it is always so dark and so unknown. Each step is a way to let the world chase, to hide your face. This is us, the pavement girls, and how we race to keep out of the shadows. Sometimes the cars go fast, blast their horns as they pass, and we hold our breath. Please don't slow. We hear of those that disappear, how they slip through hands that love them into other hands. We are told that we should remain behind locked doors when all we wanted was to see the stars. They say the night cannot be ours. We must be kept like birds or Russian dolls, nested as soon as we begin. But no bird can live without her wings, and none of us are born silent. We want to sing of the lovely dark and of living. But this is us, keys in fists, wishing on forbidden stars to be free in a world where free does not mean missing. Wow. Wow, 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 the talent. And it was only a hundred some minutes. My goodness. I had words, but I can't really put them out right now. So all I can do is introduce our next group poem from the USA, but thank you, Amy. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. This has been such an awesome showcase. And now we have a group who created um, within an intimate masterclass, Urban Word, um, with Urban Word NYC's Gabrielle Ramirez, they were asked to imagine a world where we were all free. What would we need to let go of? What would no longer exist? Here, we have Mia Prescott, Michelle Azi, April Egan, and Lydia Wei, sharing a short group poem of imagining freedom. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the capital, the city of magic, of uncaged birds and dancing girls. To the left is the compost of pop stars cashing checks on booties while other places mourn the bomb searing twin bodies. Brace yourselves, because we are entering a patriarchy-free zone and Black women are the highest paid people in these streets. Here, girls have forgotten the cold sweat that runs down their backs when a car slows down too close to them on a dark, dark street. These aren't the last days, they are the first. We are flourishers, touchers, hands in the dirt, growing teeth everywhere, no longer whispers eclipsed in drifting plastic. That was amazing. I think just from the, the first line, ladies and gentlemen, you know you're gonna go on a ride and I, I absolutely love that. That was great, that was fantastic. And we're actually going to be going back across the pond with two more group poems created as part of Yomi's workshop. This group was tasked with writing about specific countries. They were asked to zoom in on a place. What did they find? This very global and contemporary poem comes from Ireland, England, Poland, and India. Let's hear it for Les Miserables Are Still Alive by Jess Brin, Ganesha Garwal, Sinead O'Reilly, Dante Rocio, and Indranil Basu. He sang about it. He died about it. You raised it. They burnt it. Go back to the London Eye, your breath still cracking the glass. Les Miserables are still alive. Heal the wounds of this war that has been waged, trading lives for profit. 
praise to what this country has become by forefathers, virus, and Papu. Less miserables are still alive. Because I wanted to light the candles for mass, just remember it is different than run, meaningful rain. For ages, the smoking has been committed to the eye. Pray for time, the world back again in mass. On legacy of divide and confirmation, the beds are island stained. If you zoom in on India today, the land whose soil runs in my blood, you'll see the lights of fires overflowing in a flood of bodies that were COVID claimed. They float in piles down miles and claimed and claimed and named and aimed. They bob up like a miracle upon the mighty Ganga, like paper boats, like prayer notes along the shores of Darbhanga. The firewood, the gasoline has run out scarce and scared. They're contaminated, sneak them in the river too heavy to care. You'll also see the vista, oh so centrally aligned. The vastness of it all may just slightly leave you blind. Less miserables are still alive. Wow, absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Next, we're moving on to the fourth group from Yomi's workshop now. This is group poem D, who are asked to write about people who symbolize freedom. Yomi asks, how dare you speak about freedom without thinking about this person? This group responded by magically weaving together their four separate narratives to create an amazing collaborative poem. Big up to Elsie Hayward, Penny Tung, Remy Seron, and Veronica Krijavans. No, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get this right. Krijanovsky, beautiful. Can't wait to hear from you, thank you. After Emily Davidson, Rosa Parks, Kevin Carter and the birds, it was a publicity stunt for freedom. This metaphor always seems to have wings. Why do we think of birds? He had freedom to wake up, brush his teeth in the morning, flush away his business and go to work. The way decades, centuries of racism, prosecution, cruelty explodes in people's heads. He'd say, Maureen, I'd quit, but I just can't seem to scrape this child off my chest. I think it was to show the world just how desperate. Those little feather-brained individuals so often used as metaphor. She'd say, meditation, veganism, third wave feminism, or doctors. Was it just smoke and flames and chaos, a kind of madness that echoed the stamping of horses' hooves, the cheering and jeering of a crowd, or was it some great light? Bus seats turn into stampedes, protests, wildfires that set up a chain reaction of thoughtful fireworks in everyone's head. Make a movement. I don't know what kind of bravery it takes to die for a cause. It shouldn't have worked. But the ghosts lived in his hair and between his teeth, behind his eyes and the hard to reach spots in the shower. That is the sort of image a world can remember. Maybe it can travel far, but the seasons still catch them. The needs of life still catch them. When they sleep, shivering in their dreams, are there, ni are there nightmares of us? The doctors said, you know, this isn't your child, right? Because without border checkpoints or dark suits in booths behind glass, the little hollow-boned creatures can go where they will. The bullets might still hurt, not really. What fire rots between our fingernails to do what needs to be done? It aches and boils till it throws everything everyone knows out to the curb that is humanity. They are still bounded by the seasons. He carried it anyway, to the day he drove to the old playground, funneled the hose from the exhaust pipe to his window and said, I'm going to join Ken, should I be so lucky? I'm going to unsettle everyone in a new way, do it differently. Wow, absolutely amazing, thank you. We've got two more group poems to come, but for now we'll hear from the final three individual poets. Ching Min Tang explores various forms of writing to give form to a more just and more empathetic world. She is moved by the power of art and shifting worldviews and the world like Ira's poem from earlier. Ching Min's poem, Freedom Dreaming, 
also deals with the conflict between Israel and Palestine. We'll let her introduce her poem in her own words. Please give a huge round of applause for Jing Min Tang. Hi, my name is Jing Min. My poem is Freedom Dreaming, and it is written in response to what is happening in Gaza and Sheikh Jarrah and the ongoing occupation of the West Bank by Israel. Freedom Dreaming. I see my freedom in smoke swirling over prayer mats. Up and down our foreheads kiss the floor, fearing when we next kneel, it will not be there. But in our utterances before the Almighty, we live in a moment three generations ago, when the climate was quiet, without contestation, the streets not emptied by the shadow of war. My forefather gripped the ground, knowing it was his. There are so many battle lines to fight now. We must speak so many languages to be heard. In my lungs, the dust will not settle. A struggle daily revisited. Beneath our feet, the land shudders. Beneath our feet, the land is not ours. Now, only the air belongs to us. Again, another amazing poem that's dealing with this issue. I'm so happy that the poets feel brave enough to tackle this because now is not the time to shower away and I really appreciate that poem. Thank you so much. Our next poet, Wendelin Law, was born and raised in Hong Kong's concrete jungle. She's currently living in Scotland. Much of her work is shadowed by Hong Kong's urban landscape, people and current political unrest that makes her reflect on the meaning of freedom. Her poem, If I Could Be a Body of Water, reaches after a freedom from racism, prejudice and borders. This poem calls for freedom and for the chance of a soft hush instead of always a howling. Please give a huge welcome to Wendelin Law. My poem is titled, If I Could Be a Body of Water. If I could be a body of water, a shapeless body of flowing water, then I would never fall under the scrutiny of gazes. A shapeless body could not be beaten, what could not be moulded could not be remoulded. A shapeless body could not be perturbed. It devised voyeur, and no part of it could be objectified. If I could be a body of water, I would become a river. My pulse would be the calm ebb and flow, because my skin would be colourless. Prejudiced eyes could only pierce through where light would radiate through, and I would be formless. The land I could reach would be boundless. I would be countryless, because the earth to a river is borderless. But if I were this body of water, I would only be a rootless being, nameless faceless, soulless, slowly evaporating, my colourless body, swathed by smears of mud, on the torso, the rocks, the minerals, marked by cementation and compaction, until my fumbling limbs became raging waves, and if I were these raging torrents, plunging myself through landscapes that are harsh, igneous, erroneous. The sharp gorge of water-worn edges would break us. The repression and oppression of dams and reservoirs would bond us. We, the wounded bodies of water, no anodyne could assuage us rioting deluge, propelled forward by centuries-old wailings. Rattle of shackles, chattel, undulate, ululate, insoluble grit and grime, the history of silt, layer by layer, fossilized into the backbone, the long and winding, everlasting course. 
And if I could be a body of water, I would still be unfree until I could simply be a body, uttering freedom, that two-syllabled word in a soft hush, instead of always a howling. And if I were a body of water, I would still be unfree. Incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that, Wendelin. Next up, we have Elsie Hayward, who started writing poetry when she got involved in the Poetry Society's Young Poets Network, where she has been published several times, including as first prize winner in the Art to Poetry Challenge and the Ode to Small Joy Challenge. She was also commended in the Foyle Young Poets of the Year Award and Live Cannon's Children's Poetry Competition last year and has been recently given an honorable mention in the competition run by Never Such Innocence in response to conflict. You've already seen Elsie in Group D's poems and she introduced her poem beautifully. So we'll let her take it away. Thank you, Elsie. Hi, I am Elsie Hayward. I am 16 from Dorset. And this is a poem that I wrote that is exploring the freedoms of growing up, but also those pressures and constraints that modern teenagers face that curtail that freedom. It's both based on a specific memory of mine of spending a day on the beach with my friends. We were, we were kind of released from all the problems in our lives to spend that time free in nature and friendship. And it's also a more general call for freedom for young people, particularly for teenage girls, because we're so often faced with these stereotypes, being told that we're just cruel and catty, shallow and superficial. And this is really in defence of all of those teenage girls, myself and my friends and all around the world. So this is love song to teenage girls everywhere. Once upon a magic afternoon, we folded all our heavy things, put them in rucksacks and left them on the sand. There was a picture of us, intertwined, almost like old branch clasped trees, crashing to meet the sea, almost like a force of nature. We are so beautiful I could cry, but I won't. I'll try to explain. You see, the movies have us wrong. When the air grew colder, I walked around the town wrapped up in Jess's arms, Giggling, full of a sun-baked, sunset-coloured madness, we clutch each other tightly. She is not my particular friend. Many times, we have lain awake on someone's floor, poorly expressed the seedlings of dreams we'd never spoken aloud before. We have celebrated each other's rosebud loves, never mentioning Frost. Together we have felt the thrill of a midnight silent house, chattered, foreheads and fingers touching over tops of duvets to keep sleep at bay. We have made each other feel young and free and glorious and endlessly possible. We have formed protective rings when life grew too much for one, pressed tear-stained faces to our chests when everyone was looking. We have pulled clawing fingers off bellies, clapped and whooped a brave first bikini, sung hymns to hated legs and noses. We did the holding without speaking, then the gentle rebuilding when frosts came and some boys wouldn't change. We have drawn and decorated maps of the beautiful things in each other when they needed to be seen. We have reminded and been reminded about what matters and what doesn't. Lying on that stretch of beach that was ours for an afternoon, I saw some light in us that came from what we could be, reflected by what we already are. I wanted to shout at the world and at the movies. Oh God, can't you see? It is because we know and love each other too well. That was such a wonderful poem. Very glad to hear that. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, thank Next. you again. Sorry to cut you off real quick. We're actually going to have uh, one of our Youth Poet Laureates come next. Um, by the way, thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Alexandra is an 18-year-old Vietnamese-American poet from Sacramento, California. She's one of Sacramento's 2020 Youth Poet Laureates, a program of the S Sacramento Area Youth Speaks, and the Western Regional Ambassador for the United States. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, New York Times, NPR, and more. This fall, she will be a freshman at Stanford University, where she aims to combine her passions for creative writing, science, and civic engagement. Let's here for Alexandra Huynh. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. The poem I'm going to perform today is called Life Cycle of a Cat Call, and it was written in such a way that you can read it over and over again, but I'm just going to read through it twice today. But because you view my body as invitation to comment, I must now remember that I am a woman. I stop to be polite. First mistake. If you really wanted to, you wouldn't ask. Now ask me what I want. No, really. His words will decay in your chest, but you'll survive the bloat. That's what scares me. Today, I considered a steaming bowl of noodles and imagined how, in tipping it over like a chess piece in resignation, my mother would mount the mess with towels and a practiced speed, and I would watch, still, letting the hot liquid spill into my lap until I felt clean. Who knows what might happen if this body felt any less like mine? Some lauded metaphors, probably, and an excavation of the self. I am not nearly as brave as I sound in those I'm so sorry he made you uncomfy texts I send all my girlfriends. I've got flight instinct. Maybe this is my reckoning, the one where my skin finally loosens from its frame, conceding the nervous mess of flesh as inky shame leaks from every orifice, and every day I abandon the body so I may exist in spite of it. Shirts hang from me like flags on unclaimed nation, and my hair becomes freight in tow. I am a parade. I am the object of the sentence. So now everything happens to me, and none of it is my fault. But because you view my body as invitation to comment, I must now remember that I am a woman. I stop to be polite. First mistake. If you really wanted to, you wouldn't ask. Now ask me what I want. No, really. His words will decay in your chest, but you'll survive the bloat. That's what scares me. Today, I considered a steaming bowl of noodles and imagined how, in tipping it over like a chess piece in resignation, my mother would mount the mess with towels and a practiced speed, and I would watch, still, letting the hot liquid spill into my lap until I felt clean. Who knows what might happen if this body felt any less like mine? Some lauded metaphors, probably and an excavation of the self. I am not nearly as brave as I sound in those I'm so sorry he made you uncomfy texts I send all my girlfriends. I've got flight instinct. Maybe this is my reckoning, the one where my skin finally loosens from its frame, conceding the nervous mess of flesh as inky shame leaks from every orifice, and every day I abandon the body so I may exist in spite of it. Shirts hang from me like flags on unclaimed nation and my hair becomes freight in tow. I am a parade. I am the object of the sentence. So now everything happens to me, and none of it is my fault. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. That was amazing. That was, that was great. And it means that we only have one more poem for you today. I really wish there was so much more. I just could go on forever with these poems. And that final group poem is from Yomi's Workshop. This group had the most freedom of all the groups. They could respond to any of Yomi's previous prompts. When were they most free? Who do they want to speak to? What do you find when you zoom in on a country? Which person means freedom to them the most? See if you can guess which prompts they followed. Give a huge round of applause for the poets in the final group. Sigan Killip, Ayana Mandel, Veronica Cameron, and Richard Vermani. Every breath of fresh air gives me hope peace in the knowledge that everyone who's survived before me has breathed this air. The crunch of the floor gives me confidence. I feel alone, yet with the whole world at the same time. The trees wave and I feel all powerful, peaceful. Nothing could ever stop me. A train whizzes past but doesn't know I'm here. Those people don't know who I am and I just exist. I can't be judged. The birds fly past and they just ignore me. I could crawl into the earth and feel it under my fingernails and finally be at peace. Peace in the knowledge that everyone who's survived before me has breathed this air. Ants sneak into gaps between teapots and porcelain utensils from a flea market store. Liberation lining the cracks of bricks on my front porch. Ignorance is bliss. I have not yet discovered the peaks and troughs of household life, 
cushioned in the freedom of juvenile innocence. I graze my knee, stumbling off my granddad's garden swing, the brief sting reminding me of freedom's gentle kick. Peace in the knowledge that everyone who survived before me has breathed this air. My pen stutters on the page, slow as though I had never done this before, heavy as though the pen itself was weighed down with doubts and fears. I love to write, and yet in moments like these I know it more than I feel it. My pen endlessly tracing the same word over and over again. Me trying to not glance over at the clock's hand relentlessly moving forward. I close my eyes and breathe in the unmistakable scent of ink and paper. And then it comes back to me, the feeling of love for this art, for this craft, which is nothing more than words digging into the smooth white paper. My pen now racing until my hand aches. I remember why writing is power and joy, my future, my past, inspiration, liberation, arriving at last peace and the knowledge oh, that yeah. everyone who survived before me has breathed this air. I am on a lonely beach. No one is near me. Just a wild roaring ocean and me. I can raise my voice, scream louder than the waves. Let my words crush the rocks. Let my emotions come flooding out. I can sing with the sea. I have no fear of judgment. I am free, free from the shackles of my own mind. I am nature, the fluid, frothy waves that rise and fall, rise and fall in a rhythmic yet uncontrolled dance. I am truly, truly free because there I am me. Peace in the knowledge, knowledge. that everyone who survived before me has breathed this air. Uh. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I like the fact that we got to hear all the poets in that last line. That was some great editing as well. So um, I think I'm grateful to have heard all these poems. It's been amazing. We've got to hear such a wide scope of poems dealing with so many issues. And it's just been creativity all around and really grateful for the poem. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fee, and thank you, um, Na as well, who's had to go, but it's, yeah, it's just been an amazing afternoon. Um, I'm just gonna close us out with a few final words. Um, yeah, um, it's just been, yeah, this whole project has been such an amazing opportunity to uh, collaborate across borders um, and use this sort of new world that we're all living in to do something really brilliant with it uh, in a time when things are quite difficult. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you for coming. I want to say thank you to Urban Word NYC. Um, and I also want to um, say a special thanks to our hosts. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about them so you can go and find out more about them when you log off. Um, so Fien Fulua Oladipo is a British Nigerian writer whose work has been recognized in the Four Young Poets of the Year Award um, and he's been published widely on the Poetry Society. He's a second prize winner in the Christopher Tower Poetry Prize um, and he's studying in London. And Hasna Faris was born in Baghdad, Iraq and moved to the US as a refugee in 2008. She served as the Midwest's 2020 Regional Youth Poet Laureate, making her a national ambassador of poetry and released her debut collection, Cardamom, in April 2020. Um, so I hope you go and look up uh, our hosts because they're brilliant. Um, and all I think that remains for me to say is, yeah, do come and you know, check out Young Poets Network and the Four Young Poets of the Year Award and check out Urban Words work too. Um, they're doing some really brilliant things, uh, especially with a new Youth Poet Laureate in post. How exciting. Um, so thank you to Fee, to Na. Thank you to all of our poets. And let's give everyone a big, a big final round of applause. So thank you to Isha Jane, Ira, Madeline Her, Sinead O'Reilly, Maddie Kreese, Amy Wollstoneholm, Jingmin Tan, Wendelin Law, Elsie Howard, everyone in the group poems, 
and everyone in the audience. Um, thank you so much for being here and see you soon, I hope, and take care. <laughs>